Good morning. You're just in time. Welcome to the St. Gabriel Cafe, your sacred space to sip on today's local blend of faithful encouragement. Let's start our day together. Good morning. Come on in, pull up a chair. I'm Dave Orsborne. And I'm Amanda Miller. Friends, welcome to the St. Gabriel Cafe, our live and local morning show. This morning, we're chatting about evangelization. Actually, we're going to continue a conversation we had uh, that started a couple weeks ago with Liz Christie from the Columbus Diocese Office of Evangelization and Catechesis, and Jen Rice, the Director of Missionary Discipleship of uh, at St. Brendan the Navigator. So we're going to continue this conversation on evangelization because this weekend <clears throat> we're actually having the evangelization summit here in Columbus. So timely, a timely conversation. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning, Cam. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Good and gracious Lord, we praise you and we thank you for today, for your blessings and for your goodness. And in particular, for always calling us deeper and deeper into your sacred heart. Lord, we just ask for docility. We ask for trust and we ask for surrender. Lord, that you would mold our hearts to be like unto yours so that we can pour the love that you give us out to others. Lord, in those situations where we just need your words to say, to whoever is in front of us, Lord, we ask for docility and openness to the Holy Spirit to hear you, to follow you, and to love the person in front of us. And in particular, we ask for blessings upon our family, Lord, that you would draw them deeper into um, love of you, and that as a family, we would love you together. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good. Guess what? What? <laughs> I was trying to guess. You were trying to I guess. <laughs> I appreciate that. My baptismal date is coming up. Really? Yeah. Okay. So a while ago, I we were having a conversation about knowing our baptismal date, and it got me thinking, I don't, that's not something I, I remember. I so I went and I looked it up and I put it in my calendar and yeah, so it's coming up Sunday, November 17th. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. What day of the week? Uh, Sunday, November 17th. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, we'll have to have you know, Coke or uh, kale Coke. We're going to have Coke and uh, cake. Well, I don't We're gonna like, have cake. I don't like Coke, but I'll take the cake. Okay. Um, Pastries. But it got me thinking, do... Do you celebrate your baptismal day? Is that something you do? Cam, I think I've heard you say something like that. I try to. Mine's on December 9th, which is the feast day of St. Juan Diego. Okay. Um, And this year I kind of made a resolution that I don't really have a relationship with St. Juan Diego as far as like a saintly friend up in heaven. Uh, So I intend to kickstart the, that this, this baptismal date is really to pray for his intercession and say, why was I baptized on your feast day, sir? Um, and and see what, what fruit he brings in my life. I haven't thought of that. Now I have to look up what saint is on November 17th. Yeah, mine's March 29th, and I'm not sure if we celebrate with dessert. <laughs> you know, but uh, honestly, it hasn't gone much beyond that and it really should i'm just kind of okay public confession kind of pathetic and sad that it hasn't <laughs> but uh I, I mean it's on my calendar i know where it is so i have no excuse and i don't forget it mm-hmm. but yeah i don't think i've actually expressed thanksgiving and gratitude enough for it mm-hmm. elizabeth um, of hungary for you amanda on november 17th yeah so i don't know enough about her yeah. I'll, I'll have to I'll have to make friends with her. Okay. So, anyways, I I have not celebrated in the past, but I look forward to this year. So. Sorry, I'm, I'm googling feast. <laughs> Is it for your baptism? What what saint you are? Joseph of Arimathea. <gasps> really. 
Really? Sweet. How did I not know this? Do you have a connection to him? No. But he's uh, he's amazing, though. <laughs> what about him? <laughs> he's he was the was he a Pharisee? Or he was like on on the council. He's the he's the one that provided the tomb. Yes. Oh, for Jesus. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that is pretty sweet. But was he actually? Well, it says he he was a member of the Jewish council, so he was well respected both in the Jewish community as well as. Um, to the Roman authorities. So he was able to go to Pilate, right, and say, I am, let me let me have the body of, of the Lord so he may be buried properly. So I don't know exactly what yeah. the connection is between Dave and Joseph. And there has to be one. But now I can pray for yeah. that intercession and for the graces of knowing him better. Mm-hmm. I've been really inspired by some religious communities, especially like religious sisters, that they tend to celebrate even more than they celebrate like your natural birthday. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two things, first your baptismal day and then also uh, the feast day. If you take like a religious name, the feast day of the saint whose uh, religious name you took. And so uh, when it comes to baptismal days... um, I tried. I do try to celebrate as if it's a birthday mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. when I do get to those. So, yeah. Happy early baptismal day! Thank you. One. Well, what a, a great actually. As you're preparing kids for um, for the sacraments, you know, for for a con- confirmation saint, take a look at their baptismal dates and see if there's a special friend for him there. Mm. I never considered doing that. Me neither. So, there you go, friends. Today, we're looking, it's uh, Thursday, November 14th, we're looking at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 20 to 25. Asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus said in reply, The coming of the kingdom of God cannot be observed, and no one will announce, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is among you. Then he said to his disciples, The day will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. There will be those who will say to you, Look, there it is, or look, here he is. Do not go off, do not run in pursuit. For just as lightning flashes and lights up the sky, for from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer greatly and be rejected by this generation. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay. The kingdom of God is among you. Yes. I'm going to pair that with do not go off do not run in pursuit why would i do that tell me because i have a problem with patience (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) and and, uh perhaps a little monkey mind from time to time you know where, (laughs) where I'm not, I need to be more comfortable in the present moment Mm. and, um, both so I can calm myself so I can, um, appreciate exactly where the Lord has placed me in that moment with the people that are around me and, and to be, um, just kind and, um, make a gift of of my attention Mm -hmm. uh to others so recognizing that um the kingdom is is all around me so i don't have to run off i don't have to pursue pursue whatever somewhere else and look like look there he is or hey over there um to be confident and assured that he is here with me right here right now regardless of what the situation is um and to be grateful for 
for this moment and, and not to be looking elsewhere. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm taking from it. So, Yeah. Um, this, this gospel at first kind of stumped me a little bit, but as I'm kind of looking over it, um, to see that he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, it makes me think, okay, well, you know, the Jews at that time were expecting a Messiah to come in kind of this, um, military type of way and bring about the kingdom. And Jesus's reply is the kingdom of God is among you. And what we know of Jesus is, you know, he is the way, the truth and the life. And he's telling us that the kingdom of God is among us. And so I think maybe here he is referring to himself, but then it also makes me think, well, how does that apply to my life? And it's, well, because Jesus is still among us Mm -hmm. and not only among us in the mass, the Eucharist, adoration, you know, all those ways, but also dwelling in our hearts. And if we are to make the kingdom of God known, um, then we need to be able to portray the love of God to others so that others know that the kingdom of God is among us. That's where, yeah. I was really struck by the uh, Eucharistic hmm. insights in this passage, right? Um, I, I, there's something kind of funny about the way Jesus says it. No one's going to say, look, here it is, or there it is, as if they're shocked. Here he is, right? Um, for a Catholic who really believes in the true presence in the Eucharist, that shouldn't be surprising to us, right? Um, if somebody came to me and was like, I pray that the Lord would instill such a faith in his presence in the Eucharist that when somebody comes to me, if the second coming happens during my lifetime and somebody's like, look, here he is, I pray I wouldn't be surprised of like, well, yeah, great. He's been here the whole time too. And have you been seeing him? Um, The word that really sparked that in me too is the word behold. Um, For behold, the kingdom of God is among you. And I was immediately brought to think of in the liturgy, in the Mass. Uh, The time that stands out to me, one of my favorite moments in Mass is after consecration, right before communion, um, the priest raises Jesus in the air, the Eucharist in the bread and body, the the cup, the blood, um, and says, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And I've really tried to cultivate that when the priest says, behold, I would behold. Mm-hmm. I would I would uh, keep my eyes on the Lord and say, Lord, that is you. And I profess that faith. I believe it is you. Behold, the kingdom of God is among you in this room because Christ is present on the altar. Um, yeah, that just really strikes me this morning that, that I pray that I would have such a faith in his presence in the Eucharist that um, it it almost wouldn't be surprising. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, It should be surprising. It's always surprising, but in a funny kind of way, shouldn't be. Yeah. Thanks for bringing up Behold. Um, Fun fact, it's used almost 1,300 times in Scripture, Mm -hmm. the word Behold, and can mean look, pay attention, Open your eyes. So, you know, sit up and take notice. This is this is important. Behold. Open, How about that? Open your eyes. Open your eyes. <laughs> Friends, thanks for being with us in this hour of the St. Gabriel Cafe. Sure glad you're here with us. Joining us in just a couple minutes, Liz Christie. Coordinator of Communication and Events for the Office of Evangelization and Catechesis, and Jen Rice, the Director of Missionary Discipleship at St. Brendan's. We'll be here. We'll be talking about evangelization and also a bit about this coming weekend's Evangelization Summit. Stay with us. Welcome to the Catholic Man's Minute. Men, 
Can we give to our wives and children what we do not possess? No. And so we cannot transmit Christ's presence to them if we ourselves neglect to be in his presence. How do we place ourselves in his presence? Begin by planning your day around God rather than planning God around your day. Establish sacred meeting times with God throughout your day. Most of us eat three times a day. Certainly your soul is more important than your stomach. Start praying at least three times a day. And don't worry about what you will say. Simply show up and begin to be present to God in silence. Men, if we commit to this kind of daily prayer life, we will become reservoirs of unshakable peace and grace to our families. This has been the Catholic Men's Minute, a co-production of Catholic Men's Ministry and Fathers of St. Joseph and their daily devotional, LEAD. For more information on these ministries and our annual men's conference, go to catholicmensministry.com. That's catholicmensministry.com. I entered Catholic education because of its objective, the evangelization of students and families and the formation of the next generation of saints. Catholic schools are inspired by a supernatural vision, which is fixed on our final goal, heaven. It's a privilege for me to work in an environment where I can help form disciples of Jesus Christ who can know and defend the faith. Our Catholic schools are communities of faith and support that are different by design. Find your home here. Learn more at education.columbuscatholic.org. I'm Lori Kronk, and this is a Holy and Healthy Minute. Before I moved into the field of fitness, I had a small marketing company that allowed me to help businesses get the word out about their mission, product, or service. I've been known to say that marketing also applies to Jesus. What I mean is that when we love Jesus and we see how his love changes us for the better, we want to share it with others. This can be called marketing, or in the words of the church, it's called evangelization. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1913, states, Thus, every person, through these gifts given to him, is at once the witness and the living instrument of the mission of the church itself. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, help us to courageously answer the call to be marketers of Christ's mission by telling others about him and his great love for us. Amen. Welcome back, friends, to the St. Gabriel Cafe. I'm Amanda Miller. I'm Dave Orsborn, and behold, our guests, Liz Christie, Coordinator for Communication and Events at the Office of Evangelization and Catechesis, because you cannot spell evangelization without Liz. (laughs) And Jen Rice, the Director of Missionary Discipleship of St. Brendan's in Hilliard. What other words are spelled around Jen? None, really. I can't, Jen, there's, it's limited. We'll come up with one. We'll have to come up with that. Yeah. 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 There's got to be something. For sure. <laughs> sure. Maybe we'll expand to Jennifer and see what we can, see what we can get Oh my there. gosh. Possibilities, right? <laughs> <laughs> Making my head hurt. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Hi. Liz, big week. Yeah. Coming up Saturday is the Evangelization Summit. How are you holding up? We're doing good. We're two days out. We're super excited to bring everybody together. Um, this is our fourth annual Evangelization Leadership Summit for the Diocese of Columbus. So I can't believe that, actually. It's become one of my personal favorites of oh, the year. Thank you. So I'll always, uh, it's so much fun to be there. Um, the speakers are marvelous, um, but the fellowship with uh, the folks that are you know, working in the parishes, working in the schools, um, you know, laboring in the vineyard. Uh, it's just a lot of fun uh, being around, sitting with uh, different parishes at lunch and kind of hearing their conversations about what's happening. And That's good. Uh, it, thank you. It, it, it's, uh, it's a good day. This year we're bringing back the lunch break. I, uh, last year, did not allow a lunch break. We just ate while we worked, and um, that was not 
appreciated. Well so received. We will have a lunch break, a little bit of a lunch break this year. So. Guess, well, okay. I, I took a lunch break. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we're breaking the rules. <laughs> yeah. We're adding this year to adoration in the chapel all day. So if you oh, need wonderful. a break from the intensity of the day, because I do like to pack a lot of things in. I'm like, okay, we only have eight hours to give everyone as much as we can. And, and so I, I want there to be enough that everyone can have, you know, good solid takeaways, but that doesn't mean you have to participate fully in the entire day. So if you need a break, please visit the chapel and our Knights of Columbus will be there. They're going to stand guard all day with our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. So at the Ohio Dominican University. Ohio Dominican. Do they use the the? No. Is that, no. I don't think so. <laughs> Go Panthers. <laughs> Got it. But Dave okay. likes to put the on everything, yeah, I mean, so we'll, we'll yeah. just do that. <laughs> We make up our own rules here. <laughs> All right. It is the cafe, darn it. The cafe. The, the cafe. cafe. It makes everyone feel very important. <laughs> uh, I was visiting uh, the website for the summit, and I saw a verse from 1 Timothy uh, 6.20, guard what has been entrusted to you, and then also a reference from the catechism, uh, paragraph 84, the heritage of faith entrusted to the whole of the church. Hmm. And trusted stood out to me. Yeah. So that's kind of our working theme this year um, that we sent out to our speakers. So we'll see how they do at tying that in to their talks. That's always fun. You send out the theme and then we see what we end up with. But every year it's always been incredible. So um, I have no doubt it will be again this year. But um, yeah, the deposit of faith is kind of kind of an overarching theme of, you know, what is that? And and mm-hmm. so, you know, it, and Timothy's told that guard, uh, oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoid the godless chatter and the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have missed the mark as regards to the faith. So that's the full of that verse. So, um, you know, guard what has been entrusted to you, but there's more. So as we're sharing the faith, as we're going out, as we're evangelizing, are we sharing the faith that Christ gave? gave. And so then when we look at that catechism reference, um, paragraph 84, the heritage of the faith. So so Christ gave this to the apostles during his earthly ministry. You know, for three years, he, he walked with them. He very specifically chose them. He walked with them. They were handed this. And and from his resurrection to his ascension, it even becomes more intense with the, with, you know, the level at which he's preparing them because he knows he's going to leave. And of course, he sends the Holy Spirit as the advocate, but he has to, everything of our faith happened in that three-year time frame, um, and that's our deposit of faith. And so through the scripture and through the t- tradition that has been passed on from the apostles as they, you know, as they put that in the church. So um, 80, at Catechism 84 tells us the apostles entrusted the sacred deposit of the faith contained in sacred scripture and tradition to the whole of the church. So Peter, Jesus says, you're the rock and I will build the church. And and so this is the foundation of it all. So when we're talking about going out and evangelizing, it's it's really important that we understand the foundation and where it came from and know that we're not actually making stuff up. This mm, all comes right. from a place. And I think it's easy to get kind of lost in that in different ways. Like, oh, I'm thinking of this idea that's my idea that I'm going to share with someone because I think God's telling me to do that. Okay, that might be true. But are you going back to that sacred deposit? And does this fit with God with what God has asked us? So we're kind of, we're, we're taking it down to the roots this year, basically. Yeah, yeah if that makes sense. Well, um, when we were together last time, um, Jen, you had brought up um, circles of influence. And... Again, getting back you know, to the foundation, yeah, we have the deposit of faith, but then let's also take a look at where our circle, what our circle of influence is. Uh, the gospel reading when we were together last time had to do uh, with the um, with the uh, uh, with the servants, right? Um, much will be required of the person entrusted with much, and still more will be demanded of the person entrusted with more. So. It's our families, it's our marriages, it's our circles of friends that we've each been entrusted with. So 
Where do you want to jump in here? So we have the deposit of faith. So we have a responsibility to know know the faith, but then also to be able to... Um, we have to share it well. Well, and, 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 and also be transformed it. by it, right? So, so then that we can share it well and make sure people know the urgency and, and also the 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 gravitas of of um responding to the gospel yeah and it's and it all comes down to the conversion of our own hearts Mm -hmm. we must be converted towards the lord towards the faith and and from that the desire to know more kind of stems like you can teach somebody something but if the desire has not been cultivated in their own heart it can fall on deaf ears so that's where in the big picture of evangelization, this kind of all fits together. We have to introduce people to the person of Christ. Um, there has to be that that sense already there. Mm-hmm. Is it worth first asking who has been entrusted? Because just kind of going back to that one Timothy six twenty, you know, guard what has been entrusted to you, and and we know that Christ entrusted the apostles, um, you know, and then there's a line from there. Mm-hmm. Who's all entrusted? Right. So the apostles to the church, which means our popes, our, our apostolic succession, right? So our popes, and then our apostle is Bishop Fernandez. So he's the apostle of our diocese. And so it's entrusted to him, which he entrusts then to our priests, and then they give to us, and then we share with others. So there is a very specific line of of how you know things are entrusted and, and to be shared, and, and the authority to do so. So... We, all of us sitting here, are allowed to share the faith by the nature of our baptism, but also because our pastors and our bishop and our pope, like this authority comes to us from them through mm-hmm. that. So it's, so it's given to us, and then we can go out as well. So when you look at Matthew 28, go forth and make disciples of all nations, God actually only told that to the 11. He didn't say it when he was with the thousands. He said it specifically to them, and there was a reason for that because it needed to be ordered properly and set up properly. Um, and so it's interesting to think about it from that perspective, because, and if we talked about this in our last episode, that it takes the pressure of, I have to evangelize perfectly, or it depends on me, or no, we get to be involved in it, and this is the way we're involved in it. And, and then you can go from there, and you can move out, you know, kind of beyond the recipe a little bit and and share then what's in your heart because because you have that foundational understanding of like what are we supposed to be sharing and what did the Lord give? So, we're yeah. standing on others' shoulders. Yes. It's kind of like it's that you can use all kinds of images that's standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before and they have passed on the faith and it goes and then it has that ripple effect. And so we have that that foundation, the knowledge, and then we have to continue to grow that knowledge. So like Liz was saying earlier, you know, we might have a inspiration, um, but then we need to back it up. And that's why it's important to really know the faith and dive in. So let's say you're sitting at mass or in adoration and you, you have a, an inspiration. It's good to sit with that, but then it's good to, okay, where can I find that in scripture? Where can I find that in the catechism? Because there's a reason I was given this and then there's something I'm supposed to do with it. It's not just supposed to sit for my own pondering necessarily. And don't you find like when you start to see it from that realm, our faith is so credible. And so then when it's like, oh, we have to defend our faith. I mean, it's pretty easy to defend because like we have this direct line and we have the scripture and we have the catechism and we have the magisterium who oversees everything and the documents and, and all of the stuff. And it's like, you know, before I really started to dive into this, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's a little bit boring. It's not boring at all. It's incredibly <laughs> exciting. And um, and when you really dive into it from that way, it kind of opens up an excitement about our faith and also a strong foundational confidence in our faith. Like this, Christ gave this to the church. We are part of this church. We can stand on that. It's mm-hmm. a great affirmation. Yeah. Every time. As we're speaking about this, um, who it was entrusted to, two things come to mind. One, we're talking about it it being handed to the apostles and the bishops and then to our priest. 
and it makes me think, well, one, um, the importance of docility and obedience um, to partner with those in authority in the church to make sure that we do that well and to guard against any division that might try to sneak into our hearts against that. And then two, we would be very mistaken to think that we weren't also entrusted with doing the work in the vineyard um, and coming under the, the umbrella of being entrusted with this work through our bishops, through our priests, and to partner well. Yeah. And that's why we always start our summit with mass with our bishop, and then he's the first keynote talk of the day. So really, so our chief apostle, our chief catechist, our he's our guy. And so he will set the tone for the day, and, and his talk will be first. And that's why, because uh, of everything we do and hear and learn that day, um, it's most important locally because most of us attending, we do have some visitors coming from farther away, but most attending are from this diocese. So, you know, it's our priests, it's our staff, it's our parish volunteers, our school administrators, um, and then, you know, others excited for evangelization who are also joining us. So, yeah, it's it's great to always hear from him. It's very inspiring. Anytime he talks, uh, you walk away feeling very excited to, to be working in this vineyard with him. Mm. Jen Rice from St. Brendan's in Hilliard, Liz Christie from the Office of Evangelization and Catechesis for the Diocese. Looking through some of the talks and and themes, there's very um, intentionally uh, a focus on uh, marriages and family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so each year we kind of pick sort of a subject or a topic that that we kind of want to hone in on. And um, this year, marriage and family is the key. So um, we're going to, in the breakout sessions especially, you'll be able to have different opportunities to hear from our different speakers. Um, And so where the keynote talks are kind of like broad visions and broad strokes, the breakouts are the more individual, like, okay, I work in this area of parish Mm -hmm. ministry. I'd like to learn more about this or be better equipped in this area. And so that's what our breakouts do. So um, different things. We'll have one of the speakers talking about whole family faith formation, which is a huge initiative um, that we've been working on in the diocese for a number of years. Actually, Jen's parish has been doing it well for really since COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, Jacob Duran over there has done a great job at initiating that and and carrying that on. And we have several parishes throughout the diocese that have really dived into it and they're several years in and it's going really well. So so we're continuing to kind of further that model. Um, Bishop Fernandez has continued to use that as part of, you know, his two main initiatives. He always talks about evangelization and vocations. Mm -hmm. And so involving the family is really critical in both in both ways. And so then um, we'll also have a breakout session where same thing, but with the teens. So kind of like a family shaped youth ministry um, and there'll be a breakout about that. And yeah, so so kind of kind of that focus on the family is it'll be a big deal this year and then um, most likely next year as well. Okay, Jen, you got me fixated on circles of influence <laughs> now. And how my mind is working. <laughs> it's circles of influence in the form of a Venn diagram. Yep. Okay. I gotcha. <laughs> right. I'm following. All right. So it, it's one way to, to, okay, within the family, within the domestic church, only to look at it as, um, as some sort of a hierarchy, mm-hmm. you know, dad, mom, then the children, um, kind of a, a top down. But it, it, if you really look at it as, um, a circles of influence that everyone in the family, regardless of whether a child or a parent, um, has a circle of influence and how those overlap between their world outside the family to the world within the family, how everyone in the family should be empowered to, um, to evangelize the others. So it's just not, you know, dad, you know, sitting the family down for family catechesis on a Wednesday night. The, the, the child has as much to bring into the family in terms of evangelization and discipleship as dad. And, and I think this is probably a big part of the work 
that's being done in the parishes um is is this where whole family formation is that the point that it gets to that that it's a shared responsibility with um um the shared circle of influence right so so everyone everyone has a role to play it's just not a top down it can be it can be and so when we're forming our families i have to think of our families i mean that's our first mission field right and we're forming our our families to go out on mission in whatever environments that they're going into and so it is about catechizing but also why why does this matter why how am I going to raise my children in a way that they can go out and practice these virtues and offer grace to other people? You know, what do I need to do within my family to, to teach them why this is important and then show them how in those little ways. And that happens with um, family rituals and prayer time. And so like intentional prayer time at dinner, not just bless us. Oh Lord. Okay. What else you got? So we, in our, at our family, we do the bless us our, our Lord, and then we go around and like, what are we going to specifically pray for? Is there someone um, in our school that needs prayer? Um, and I have a test coming up to, is there somebody at church that needs is sick? You know, all of those things come out. So just that one simple example teaches them that also that they, no matter how old they are, they can go out and evangelize and, and into their circle of influence. Mm-hmm. A, a story that comes to mind actually is Dave, as you're sharing this, I, this Venn diagram, you know, it's not just top down, but everyone's re- takes on responsibility. And it makes me think of the story. I believe it was, um, Emily Jaminette who was sharing a story of her family when she was here in the cafe with us. And I guess one of her kids had a bunch of friends over and was some of the friends were not using the Lord's name appropriately. And so she pulled her her son aside and was just like, okay, like you know the rules of the house and you know what we believe. Um, so you have to step up and talk to your friends. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought that was a beautiful example of not only you know the rules of the house, but also here's what we believe, but also take responsibility of, of living that out as well. And I, so I like this idea of bringing the whole family into one, an understanding of the faith, and then two, how do we live it out well? One of the speakers at the, at the summit is Monsignor Shea in, in, in his book, From Christendom to Apostolic Age. You just think of how uh, the shared responsibility that we have um, in a family, in a parish or whatever, it can come back around to the circles of influence we all touch on some segment or group or um, uh, you know friend circle or whatever that that needs evangelized. It needs to hear uh, the gospel. So that's how the in the apostolic age evangelization happened. It happened in households, and then it happened, you know, in in um, all these different spheres. Um, and, and that's very encouraging, actually, if everyone shares a view of, of um, proclaiming the gospel that way that everyone in the family has that responsibility or um, the, um, just the, um, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The um, opportunity, the, it's a great opportunity. Uh, it's a gift to be able to bring the gospel into whatever circle, how, how quickly hope will spread. Cause one of the things I think we're missing so much is, is, is hope. Mm. And, and if we're able to bring that light into all these dark corners, um, you know, Amanda, you're going to reach into corners that, you know, Cam or I, we're, we're just not living in that world, but you, you have the opportunity to shine the light into that corner. Um, and how it's up to all of us. Well, and ex- that's exactly um, the whole point of uh, Pope Francis. One of the, I would say one of the marks of his pontificate is he's really stressed this idea that by virtue of our baptism, we are all called to be missionary disciples, right? 
I think there's a lie that can worm its way into the church sometimes that because evangelization, the priority of it belongs to the bishop or the priests, I, as a lay person, don't have to do anything about that. But that's a lie. Um, th- there's this like really beautiful, the, in the words of Vatican II, this really beautiful, like the bishops as as handed down from the apostles are extensions of Jesus that way. And then extensions of the bishops are the priests, and then extensions of the priests are us, the laity. It's not like a belittling, but actually it's an empowerment Mm. for us as lay people to be that. Because the reality is, Bishop Fernandez is not at your dinner table most nights. You know, your your parish priest also probably not uh, hanging out at your at your Halloween party or your Thanksgiving friendsgiving or things like that. Um, But that's a beautiful thing the gospel is still present there because you are there well nor are they at the um in the cubicle next to you with, with the with the guy or, right. or, or or lady that have uh, marital issues right now or or grandchildren or children away from the church they're not able to be at uh, the uh the lunch table in the school cafeteria but we all have those opportunities then to to be the hands and feet too yeah, and I think Cam, you're exactly right. Like by nature of our baptism, that is our call, right? And so, part of I think what we're trying to do on Saturday is to like remind everybody, like this is the call. We constantly tell parents, you're the primary educators of your children in the faith, but do we equip them to actually be that? And you know, back to Monsignor Shea's book, like when we lived in the time of Christendom, and your entire community was Christian, there was. There was an ease there of, yes, we can drop our kids off at school or PSR because they also are being exposed to Christianity at the dinner table with the neighbors, with the friends they play with. And so it was just kind of everywhere. And then eventually over time, it stopped being everywhere. And now, you know, it it less and less. So so we're in his book, it, it proposes, you know, we're back in that apostolic age. So we have to take the initiative to to evangelize and to spread the gospel but at the same time the models that worked when we were in a more predominantly christian society aren't working now and so when we're only dropping our kids off at church or we're only sending them to school to learn the faith but we're not living that in our homes or we're not you know doing that we see things fall short and we're living in that reality right now so you know the the parents Husband and wife, their goal is to get each other to heaven and mm-hmm. the kids they bring into the world to get them to heaven. And so we have to kind of reclaim that a little bit. And and when that is strong, everything around it can also be strong. So um, it's about empowering our parents. And to do that, we have to empower our parish leaders who are working with the parents. And so, And so that's kind of a goal of this day is to like, go out with a fresh excitement and yes, this is what we're working towards. This is the call of our baptism. This, and so, um, well, I think at the same time, Liz, we, we have the responsibility as parishioners Mm -hmm. then to share what, um, our lives look like. Yes. I mean, if we're only doing it in a confessional, (laughs) right. And and, and the word's not going to get out, right. Um, it can't get out. Um, but if, if we're going to, the DRE or to the director of missionary discipleship and say, you know, these are some of the things that we're facing in our home. These are some of our challenges. That's on almost the negative side, but on the positive side, what we found really works in our family. Um, want to bring it to your attention. This is how we approach, um, family prayer just to have that dialogue and not look at it as a, as a top exclusively a top down or even a bottom up, but it, as more of a partnership and how a, a community or a family actually functions. Yeah. And I think, Jen, same for you. Like you had another career before you were in this one, right? And yeah. Yeah. Same for me. And so, I mean, that came from the Lord calling, you know, and, and saying yes to that. And I'm sure for you, it was the same thing of like, how did you get to where you are? Well, the Lord inspired that in you. And so I feel like in all of our parishes and often I'll tell the priest this, like, look for those people. They might just be sitting in the pews, but the Lord might be doing something really significant in their hearts. 
and inspiring them in a way to kind of help you in this vineyard and find them and empower them and let them help you too. And so, yeah, that's born out of families. It's born out of um, married couples, single people. You know, I mean, the Lord, he, he works with all of us in those ways. And that's the the hope of the programs that we that we run to, you know, is that it is taken out. They can't just be relied on the church to, you know, we have lots of outstanding Bible studies. You can come here and, and get all get really fed. But if it doesn't bring it out and more people raised up as leaders and mission leaders, then it's really it's fruitless. I think. Mm -hmm. And so one of the wonderful things I love to see is to watch in our, in our women's studies as watch new leaders emerge and facilitators and then bring someone else to the table or go out and start their own small group, you know, to spread it out of there because it is a lot. I, I know Liz will agree for it to, all of it to fall on our shoulders to run the programs and things. And, um, but it's about making it a, you know, making it a priority. Why is it important that you do this and not us do this all the time? Yeah. It, it, nothing can like start and stop with yeah. us. Like if we disappeared tomorrow, everything should continue on. And so it's important to have that mindset with all of evangelization. Like, yes, I'm doing this work today, but it can't only happen if I'm doing it. And so um, as we're building up new leaders, that's an important message to kind of make sure people are aware of. Because otherwise we get into these silos of like, well, this is the group that does this and no one else can do it. And then mm -hmm. the church kind of, again, the division sneaks in, as you were saying earlier, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Liz Christie and Jen Rice here with us. We're talking about evangelization. Coming up on Saturday is the Evangelization Summit at Ohio Dominican University. Yeah, there, there's this, yeah, there is a hierarchy for all the reasons that you brought up, Liz, I mean, and, and I mean, that is um, the way it's intended, that that is God's plan for the church. But um, I, I think if it's only treated as um, an institutional bureaucracy, which, which is an awful way to look at it, but how many of us actually do look at, at, at the parish as kind of, that that institutional setting rather than a community and, and, and to give kudos to saint brendan's i i really from knowing a lot of people there um and just knowing how you work together um community comes first that way and then the institutional benefits of having experts in different areas is um almost a fruit of having the community come together does that make sense? So you're putting families first, you're putting friendships and working together first, and then you see how that kind of flows into into the church in order then to be effective and efficient and reach people in a better way. Yeah, I think we have we have that model working really well there where it's it's not about us. It's about, it is about the community and what is the community's need and desire and come to us and ask, you know, okay, I'm seeing a need. And uh, for example, right now, the, like the, the parents of middle schoolers, for example, mm -hmm. are wanting to have, um, to be fed a little bit more. They're not fitting into any quite category. And so it's, okay, well, we're not going to run a program for you, but here's some suggestions that you take to the moms and you, um, do this book study in someone's home or you pray together, you know, so it's just kind of being that support person and, uh, and encouraging the community to develop, mm -hmm. um, I, I think is really, really important. And again, we, like we talked earlier, what are those practical examples that you can do in your own family or your own friend group that you don't have to rely on the church to do for you? Sometimes too, I think people just need the permission yes. that it's okay for you to do this. Like there are things that you can only run at a parish with permission of pastor. Mm -hmm. But there are many things that you can do on your own to evangelize. Last time we were together, we talked about the Walk With One campaign. It's bringing that back in. I mean, you don't need anyone's permission to go and walk with someone and evangelize them. And that's the, the point of that program and the beauty of it. So that one does not start and stop. It is not confined within the walls of our parishes. And it's not meant to be. You're, it's not meant to be something you're running in a parish. It's meant to be what you're living out in your mm -hmm. life. And so... Um, 
as we work with people, equipping them, empowering them, giving them permission, like, yeah, the Lord wants you to work in the vineyard. And here are some practical ways of how you can do that, but here are some ways for you to listen to what the Lord's asking and how to discern that well. And so, again, that's walking with people in a different way. You said last time, walk with some or a few, or <laughs> I think we're walking with a lot, yeah. um, <laughs> especially you, Jen, in your role. I mean, but um, yeah, it's important to to just let people know what they can do and what they're allowed to do. Yeah. What are some of the fruits that you've seen, Liz, from the uh, event? This is the fourth evangelization summit, right? Um, I've heard uh, we just last month we had um, a couple in from Miraculous Metal that started doing um, a door-to-door canvassing of houses in 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 their parish boundaries, taken specifically from. Bishop Fernandez's um, spiritual entrepreneurship, yes, as well as some comments that Father Ricardo made at last year's evangelization summit to um, to, to be bold and, and then to use the tools and the skills that you already have in order to spread the gospel. I'm sure you have stories. Well, yeah, I'm just I'm struck by hearing that one because you're talking about that was the multi-year process that they have put together into this ministry because the spiritual entrepreneur talk was two years ago Oh, okay. and father Ricardo was with us last year. And so to hear that, and I know who you're talking about, I know them and they're a beautiful couple and to hear that that's what they've put together to do that. That's so edifying that, you know, because it's part of the thing is we do the things we plan the events and we hope people show up and we hope people have good takeaways. Um, we do usually do like an evaluation afterwards just to kind of hear and, I love reading through those, whether it's good or bad, but just to hear like, this was so helpful to me. This was my takeaway. This was a life changing thing for me to hear our bishop say, or another speaker say. Um, But one of the things I find that I always appreciate is when a pastor and his staff and parish leaders attend together. I Mm -hmm. think that is so beautiful. And you, and you can kind of see, you know, you see everyone sitting out there and what a beautiful example of living this out. Like, let's come together. Let's divide up the breakouts and go, you know, each of us go to different ones and then they'll plan dinner that night or later in the week, they'll have a time to get together to kind of debrief what they all learned. I mean, to me, that would be the ideal. If every pastor and parish did that um, and used the summit in that way, I think that would be amazing. So. But I would assume not just what did we learn, but okay, now how can we put what we learned into Mm -hmm. action, those action plans? And I think the connections that people make with our speakers and also like our exhibitors that happen to be there and the different resources, um, it's neat to see. I try to follow as many social medias and parish communications as possible because I want to just see what everyone's doing. Yeah. And then when I see the little things sprinkled around, like, oh, they're doing that that was somebody we brought in, you know, like, so you can, you can see it lived out in that way. And then, you know, then what we don't see is like, okay, then the people that are, you know, benefiting from that, what does that look like? And so, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to, to just, I mean, event planning for Jesus is (laughs) one of my favorite things to do. So this is what Saturday is all about. This is for Jesus. It's for, you know, the church and, and we're bringing people together. And so the planning of the event and the details and all the things that go into it to help the day run smooth so that people can live out the gospel message and share that with others. Um, And so, yeah, we, we hope and pray every year that that's, what we're doing and that's what's happening mm-hmm. yeah. three main keynote speakers yes um, so we have uh, bishop fernandez mm-hmm. uh, monsignor james shea and then uh, your boss dr del <laughs> yes so three great keynote speakers so i think they'll anchor the day really well um we'll hear that we'll have mass and then we'll have the two keynotes first bishop fernandez monsignor shea little lunch break, then we'll go into our breakouts. So back-to-back sessions that repeat. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you didn't catch it in session one, you can catch it in session two. Um, But we have like eight breakouts, so you only really get to pick two. Are they all being, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot. Most are being recorded. Okay. Most. Um, So we usually try to do that, and then we share them afterwards and post some on our 
um, website and things. And yeah. then, so yeah. friends, we understand. I mean, this is coming <laughs> up in just a couple of days. If you haven't registered, go to uh, columbuscatholic.org. Um, love to have you there in person. Obviously, two days away. Not all of you will be able to make it in person, but there is so much great content. And, and I think what we've touched on, just ideas, just uh, things to plant seeds for both, um, well, for individuals to, to use as well as uh, families, but then, of course, parishes. So if you're not able to be there in person, stay tuned. Get on get on Liz's uh, mailing list. Yeah, uh, you can join our <laughs> flock note. I'll... I'll share a link with you guys later. Um, but yeah, we, we, we love to, we love to have everybody come in and just spreading, spreading the message of the gospel. I mean, it's the key to all that we're doing. So, Mm -hmm. and we, we start and end our day with the Lord. So at the Holy mass in the morning and then adoration, um, we always end with adoration so that we can have that quiet time with the Lord to process all the things. Like I said, I like to pack the day full of a lot of things and then, you need to sit still and then take that to the Lord and, okay, Lord, I'm excited about these 25 things I just heard about, but which ones do you want me to focus mm-hmm. on? Mm-hmm. And, you know, in my personal ministry, in my parish ministry, in my family, where's the focus? And so mm-hmm. that's the point of that prayer time is to then walk away with a little bit of, not closure, but like a little bit of like peace in in that conversation with the Lord. So, yeah, it's important. Okay, Jen, I put Liz on the spot in your turn. Um, practical takeaways from today's conversation. Just uh, ev- evangelizing to our circles of influence. You can reflect on the Venn diagram. <laughs> y- 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 your choice. But. I, j- I just think just like we have the walk with one, then do one thing. All right, what is one thing that you can do in your family um, or in your circles of influence that... W- you know, might change the picture a little bit, might enhance what you're already doing. You know, um, I think about, uh, for example, uh, a lot, some of the women have come to me because we're doing the chosen. We put Mm -hmm. together study guys, guides. Can I have those copies to use with my kids, with my families? And so I've got several families who are doing the chosen together and discussing and, you know, so they're learning about Jesus in a different way. And then um, we have a, part of that that that's about going out on mission every time what does that mean and so as a family then they're going to go out on mission based on what they saw in Mm -hmm. this episode so something simple or like i guess that's a little more complex but you know change up your prayer um asking the children what they want to pray for who needs help at school who needs this those those tiny little things ripple out and they make a huge difference amanda Yeah, actually, I had a thought when we were talking about the walk with one. And as we're talking about, you know, the whole family taking on the initiative to spread the gospel, it made me think, well, why can't a walk with one be a family walking with one or a family walking with a family? And bringing the kids into how to evangelize or how to just walk with one, to just be that ministry of presence um, and to learn how to live out your faith day to day with others. Mm -hmm. I think that would be an excellent idea. Similar thoughts. Talk to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's people within the parish or, you know, people next to you in the pew, you know, share, ask for advice, ask for insights, but then also share, share your, your success stories with others. So. Amen. Liz and Jen, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck this weekend. See you Saturday. (laughs) Amanda, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. God love you all. Tomorrow, Chrissy Chalky and Stephanie Rapp. God bless you all.